The site of the Recherche and Esperance Observatories uh, was of critical importance to the mission. So it was quite close to the anchorage and elevated a bit above the surroundings. So it would have given them a clear view of the southern horizon and the ability to track uh, the motion of stars throughout the night to make the critical observations that they needed. So at the time, astronomy, geology, geography, oceanography were not really separate sciences, but they were all intimately connected to the practical science of navigation, and their observations would have reflected that. So they would have been most concerned with tracking the movements of stars as they pass directly overhead as a way of calibrating the ship's uh, longitude. And they would have also been quite interested in measuring the angle between the moon and the sun very accurately. And they attempted to measure eclipses of the moons of Jupiter, but apparently they were not successful in that. All those things would have been related to the work of charting uh, the coastline and confirming the ship's position for the safety of the crew. They also made observations that we today think of as um, geological in nature, and that established the variation of the Earth's magnetic field with latitude. So it was the beginning of that field of science. In 1791, the King of France sent two ships, La Recherche and the Esperance, meaning research and hope, with over 200 men. So Bruni d'Entrecasteaux entered his ships into Recherche Bay looking for water. The first encounters of the French and the Tasmanian Aborigines were friendly. On, in, on their second voyage in 1792, they met on the beach with nearly 10 families, which they ate, feasted together on the beach, eating mussels and crayfish. They danced, they swapped uniforms, and uh, some, uh, they had the sailors cut their hair, where they were able to study their, the way they lived, they shared meals together, they played games together, they sung and uh, played music. One of the most interesting person on board would be Marie-Louise Girardin, who had disguised herself as a man. She called herself Louis Girardin and was a steward for Kermedec, the captain of the Esperance. So Marie-Louise Girardin would have to be the first European woman to land on Tasmanian soil. some geological significance at research and we really only discovered it in recent times after the TLC took over ownership and uh, what we discovered was along the western shoreline where the little beaches are uh, there are some outcrops of sandstone, Triassic sandstone and uh, within those sandstone outcrops at shoreline level, there are at least half a dozen fossil logs or fossil trees preserved. And uh, bear in mind that Triassic sandstones are uh, 200 million years old, so these are very old trees from before the time of the flowering plants. So they're conifers, probably something like our present day uh, celery top pines perhaps, and they were washed into the river at the time, deposited on the, the river flats in the sand, covered over, and they've been sitting there for 200 million years, more or less, and in that time they've been um, petrified or fossilised, so that now they consist of a very hard, dark, rock material, but within that the original structure of the fossil wood is still preserved. And the biggest of them is about um, 30 centimetres diameter and about 8 metres long. And it's lying there between the high and low tides within the sandstone and it's partly been broken up by the surf action, the wave action. 
And what's really nice about it is that much of the fossil wood has been broken up into little bits, two or three centimetres across, and they have been spread along the little beach nearby. So for about 100 metres of that little sandy beach is totally covered by thousands if not millions of little fragments of 200 million year old fossil wood. And some of those pieces, uh, if you pick them up, you can still see the original growth ring structures in the wood and the texture of the wood fibres even. Now that's very unusual in a Tasmanian context and this is one of the best, if not the best, example of fossil wood in Tasmania. Research Peninsula and the whole of the Southport area. We're well south and it's largely wet forest uh, dominated by stringy bark eucalyptus obliqua and open sedgy moorlands. On the TLC block on the Research Peninsula itself there's very little moorland. It's almost always forest and most of it is stringy bark forest. Varies quite a bit uh, from quite dry with just a prickly understory that's often on the sandstones to uh, much thicker vegetation with a rather wet understory of tea tree. Going into the centre of the block the understory becomes broadleaf shrubs and in the oldest part of the forest we've actually got rainforest regrowing underneath the gum trees. These kinds of vegetation on the peninsula have been very much influenced by fires, particularly in the last 200 years, since Aboriginal firing was no longer very important, but firing following uh, various white men's activities, particularly timber getting, happened pretty frequently and is becoming more frequent these days. We're very lucky that the, the central part of the Research Peninsula, unlike any of the rest of the Southport area, retains forests where the oldest trees possibly were seen by the French that certainly uh, date back older than say the early 1900s. In that area which is perhaps the most interesting we have a rainforest understory regrowing, we have traces of the old logging activities which were selective logging and went until almost the 1920s, beautiful old stumps with crowns of ferns on top and the old shoe cuts because it was all done by hand with cross cut saws and you had to put a shoe in to get high enough to start cutting in the good wood. In that part of the forest we also have a rather amazing spectacle of Parsonsia vines making basket work around some of the, the very old eucalypt trees. This is something which happens a little bit in the far south of Tasmania, but it's pretty rare and unusual. Well, the, the French uh, were uh, stationed there for some time, fixing their ships, and La Balladier, the botanist, was able to wander around the country quite considerably and do very extensive botanical surveys. Several of our important plants uh, have their type areas coming from La Balladier's collection down there, and it, it's very encouraging to note that all his species are still there. There are about 190 flowering plant species have been recorded from the whole Southport research area and that includes everything listed by La Balladier. One of the really interesting things is that uh, he produced the type specimens for our state emblem, Eucalyptus globulus. It's not entirely sure from his records where he collected his specimens, but it seems pretty likely to have been on the Research Peninsula. Today, on the eastern side of the peninsula, largely in the conservation area, is a most beautiful blue gum forest. We like to call this La Balladier's forest, although the trees are probably too young to have been the ones he saw. The ones he did see were probably right in the centre of the peninsula. Now, as other people have said, the French encountered 
uh, the Aboriginal locals very happily on their expeditions. They wandered all over the peninsula. The fact that they were able to wander all over it suggests that Aboriginal burning had rendered the peninsula much more open than it is these days. In particular, uh, the site of the French garden would have to have been in the open. I can't imagine the French trying to build a garden in a thick gum forest. Its present situation is near the edge of what we call the fire corridor, an area which always burns. If there's a fire coming in from the north, that fire corridor across the top end of the Research Peninsula is where fires come. I think that was probably quite open country when the French arrived. They made some maps of the traverses they did and most of their tracks went through that country. It's very important now, if we're to preserve these oldest forests in the whole area, in the centre of the peninsula, that we keep fires out of that corridor. Research Bay is a, an amazing place, not just because uh, people have been living there for thousands of years, but in 1792-93, the French expedition under Don Tricasto arrived there, full of two, two ships, one called the Research, the other the Esperance, meaning hope. And they'd been battered around a bit and they made repairs and they set up their village and their garden and their blacksmith shop and uh, restocked up on greenery, and got over the scurvy. They circumnavigated Australia and they loved the place so much that uh, they, ca they came back to Research Bay and uh, from Western Australia and this time, second time, in early 1793 they met the Lilaquani people, the Aborigines who occupied the area. And it's just a weak story but um, in that week there were music episodes, there was athletic, an athletic contest, there was feasts and these two totally different sets of human beings from different sides of the planet, different religion, different uh, race, different set of beliefs, no language con uh, contact, got along, understood, were forbearing with each other. And when the French sailed out at the end of that week or 10 days, the Aborigines built fires and uh, were, but it was, it was a, a really sad farewell. I th it's, it's a peace field. We celebrate battlefields everywhere. We should celebrate a peace field like this. Uh, it's, got, it's got a story for the world in where if we seven billion people don't get along with each other, whatever our differences might be, and let's celebrate the differences, uh, then we're in trouble. And so I think there's a huge message for the world that no matter how different, different people are, they can get along together and they take a little bit of care about it. Uh, it's, it's an enchanting place in so many ways and we have so much more to learn about it. Uh, I love the place and I love the idea that now a hundred or a thousand years from now people like us are going to be able to enjoy it because Tasmanian Land Conservancy is looking after it. It's a great feeling.